Well, let's get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Morningstar, the founding director and chairman of the uh, Global Energy Center here at the Atlantic Council. I think most of you know me by this time. And on behalf of the Global Energy Center, we're very happy to welcome, as part of our CEO series, um, Meg Gentle, who is the president and CEO of Tellurian. Um, Meg has had extensive experience in the energy sector uh, before coming to Tellurian. She was executive vice president at, uh, uh, for marketing at Chenier. She's worked with Anadarko, Pace Global Energy Services, has had a long career uh, in the energy business and specifically with respect to gas. Tellurian, as I think most of you know, uh, was established in early 2016 by LNG industry pioneers Shari Suki, who is also here and whom we welcome, uh, and Martin Houston. It was established uh, amid the shale revolution uh, as U.S. liquefied natural gas exports were beginning to take off. So Tellurian's aim, which Meg will talk about, I'm sure, is to develop low-cost LNG projects along the US, uh, uh, U.S. Gulf Coast, the first of which is the Driftwood uh, LNG project, which is expected to be operational in the very early 2020s. And she was tapped to be Tellurian CEO by Sharif and uh, Martin Houston in August of last year uh, to shepherd the development of the Driftwood Driftwood project and to lead Tellurian's path forward. So <clears throat> Meg joins us today to discuss the U.S. role in global gas markets as producers worldwide grapple uh, with the current low energy price environment and influx of LNG in a changing energy landscape. And so we look forward to hearing more about Tellurian. The, how they see their LNG development and plans to deliver LNG at a low cost to customers around the world. I also want to mention before turning the uh, microphone over uh, to Meg that uh, last week, uh, as part of our Central, Eastern, and European conference, we launched a new paper on LNG by our senior fellow, Bud Coote, who's in the middle of, middle of the audience uh, there. Uh, and uh, Bud, as many of you know, spent, I always say, 42 and a half years, not just 42 years, as the energy analyst at the, uh, principal energy analyst at the CIA, and probably knows more about the ins and outs uh, of, uh, of LNG as just about uh, just about anybody. So I would encourage all of you <clears throat> to pick up a copy of the report, which I think is outside. Uh, so let me then uh, welcome uh, Tellurian's president and CEO, Meg Gentle. She'll speak f for however long. Then we'll have a moderated uh, dialogue and open it up to the audience for your questions and comments. Thank you, Ambassador, for your very kind introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today and giving me the opportunity to talk to you um, about energy security, particularly in the Atlantic region. Um, after the success of an amazingly resilient uh, oil and gas drilling uh, sector, the US is now becoming an exporter of energy. And so we're at a crossroads, which really gives us an opportunity to change the energy balance of power and create more security, um, better uh, environmental conditions, and better economic growth for our own country and for our allies. Um, I'd like to emphasize today that the US is a reliable, affordable, and growing source of energy. Uh, for the Atlantic region and really for the world. And so we're going to talk about several things, but we know that the evidence is now clear that we're continuing to reduce costs um, for U.S. production. We are among the lowest cost producers in the world, um, and we will soon be the largest exporter of natural gas in the world. 
So we're going to focus on three things, really. Number one, the success that, that we've had um, in our own industry in the U.S. Uh, number two, the status of LNG export infrastructure for what I would call phase one, uh, which is from now till 2020. Um, and then we're going to look forward a little bit to the 2020 to 2025 period and talk about what is needed for the future. Let's see. Okay. I think that's just, don't believe anything I say. Okay. Um, so before we get, can everybody hear me? If I get away from the, no. Is this on? Oh. Now does it work? Okay. Okay, so we get, before we get too far into the data, I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So um, I put this up. This is a photograph of Beijing taken in 2015. And I have to say that although I've been in the natural gas business for several decades, it wasn't until I went to Beijing that I finally really, really understood why the world needs natural gas. You wouldn't want to um, walk down the street breathing this air for a day, uh, let alone live in it for your whole life and raise your children there. And thankfully, China agrees with that because this air floats up and then gets rained down on Northwest Europe, California. Um, and so as of March of this year, um, the last coal-fired power plant in Beijing has stopped producing electricity and the uh, policies to promote natural gas use um, are being actively pursued. So in 2016, China and actually India, I think the two biggest culprits of uh, polluted cities, have been uh, increasing their natural gas uh, consumption, their natural gas imports, by over 30 percent. Um, and we expect that trend to continue. And China and India aren't the only places that this is happening. Everywhere around the world, people really are starting to care about um, air quality, and we need to provide cleaner energy. I think this isn't a big surprise to many. This picture may be a bigger surprise. Am I pointing this to the right place? Am I pointing this to the? OK. Um, so this photograph, it looks very, very similar. This is Pittsburgh in 1944. Um, and it, at this time in Pittsburgh, people were actually reporting deaths that were resulting from smog. And in 1948, there was finally enough, uh, I think 25 deaths, enough to provoke a change. And there were oil pipelines in the US that were converted to natural gas. They're now part of the Texas Eastern gas pipeline system um, and brought natural gas to the Northeast. And uh, I think today Pittsburgh is actually one of the highest cities on the list of US cities where you would like to raise your family. So um, we know that natural gas makes a difference. It um, produces at least 50% less carbon emissions than uh, coal-fired power and almost no uh, particulate of uh, particulate matter, NOx and SOx. So um, we really, we are an economic uh, body trying to make money in this business, but we all have a responsibility um, to future generations to, to provide this to the world. So there are a lot of questions I know that um, people wonder about the industry. Uh, do we have enough supply in the U.S. to um, supply our own market and be able to export um, for our allies uh, that are buying gas from us? Will that supply be reliable? Um, will it continue into the future? Will the U.S. government support exports on a sustained basis? And, and I'm happy to say that I think the answer to all those questions, frankly, is yes. Um, this is a map. Uh, all the blobs on the map are the basins where we're producing gas, and the lines are the pipeline system. Um, and I think all of you here are, are actually familiar with this. 
um, over 300 TCF of approved reserves and over 1,000 TCF of additional resource that can be produced, um, we say below $4, but every single day those drilling costs are coming down. Um, and in fact, the cost to produce gas in the field is now less than a dollar per MMBTU. So very successful um, industry and, and base that uh, has been established over decades. I think in, last year we produced 72 BCF a day of natural gas. Um, the one thing that I would highlight is changing here is that the resource base that's growing a lot is coming from um, the Permian, which is here, and the Marcellus, which is in the Northeast. And we don't yet have sufficient infrastructure to bring that gas um, to market. So the Northeast gas will be able to supply the Northeast, and there is excess gas. Um, we have been growing production almost every year for the last 10 years um, at a rate of about 4% per year and our own demand only grows about 1.3% per year. So we are definitely growing uh, our production faster than our demand. So the natural question, of course, is where is it going to go? Um, and uh, we have to increase not only our export infrastructure, but also pipeline infrastructure to bring gas into the Gulf Coast from uh, the Northeast and uh, also from the Permian. So this is, I think, what Tellurian is trying to do. Um, we're seeking always the lowest cost uh, infrastructure, both from the supply side, the pipelines connecting them, and, and going into LNG infrastructure. So that leads me then to what is actually the state of LNG exports today. Um, you all know that we have been in a, about a four to five year period of intensive um, construction. Uh, we actually, as an industry, began planning export infrastructure in the lower 48 uh, back to 2008 or 2009, and we had first exports uh, last year. Um, there's a facility in Alaska, but in the lower 48, there are six uh, LNG terminals that are either in operation um, or under construction, and when they're completed, uh, which all should be done by 2020, um, we will be able to export 67 million tons of LNG. So in the LNG business, we talk in million tons, but that is uh, equal to about 10 BCF a day of natural gas. Um, when we get to that level, to that full production, we will be about 20% of the LNG market um, or the LNG supply which is the third largest producer. And we wouldn't be the American way if we weren't going to try to be the first largest <laughs> producer. So we will continue from here. Um, so OK, that, that supply, 20% of the market, where is it going to go? We know that it, it will, some will go to Asia, some will go to South America. But it's very, very important, the opportunity that we have um, to enhance the energy security in the Atlantic region. Um, our allies in the Atlantic are, you know, our natural market. We have a transportation advantage uh, going to Europe. And I would ask you to sort of digest a few facts about Europe. Europe consumes about 45 BCF a day of natural gas. Remember, we produce 72 BCF a day. Um, they receive gas, well, produce some gas uh, indigenously. Um, about 30% of the market is supplied by Russia and the rest by Algeria, Nigeria, Trinidad, Qatar, and a few cargoes already um, from the United States. Um, so clearly, the benefits in Europe for uh, diversified supply, um, open access to infrastructure, free choice in where you get your gas and where you get your energy um, are all things that, that we're trying to be supportive of as a U.S. gas industry. Um, okay, for the future. So, so as we look toward 
uh, from now till 2020, we know what the landscape is. Uh, if we're not in construction on infrastructure today, it won't be there for the market by 2020. Uh, so as developers, we are actually looking at the market from 2020 to 2025. Uh, and we can see that demand is actually steadily growing worldwide. Um, on a global basis, the market is about 365 BCF a day, and it grows at a moderate pace, just 1.7, 1 1.8% uh, growth per year. But that's a lot of gas. That's seven BCF a day of gas that has to be added to the production base every single year. And keep in mind, I mean, it's taken us uh, in the US, um, you know, almost a decade to add that much new gas production. Um, and the world has to do that every single year. So this is a pretty Herculean task. And as, um, as we look forward to 2025, we know that uh, there will be new pipelines bringing pipeline gas, but the LNG business will be a very, very important uh, new supplier. So for the LNG market itself, what does the picture look like? This is a supply and demand analysis done by Wood McKenzie. Um, and we can see already for 2021 to 2025, uh, we are short. We as producers of LNG are short supply um, into the market for what the market is asking for by 2025. Um, there's a small period here, which I think everybody worries about and talks about today, where it looks like there is more supply than demand. Um, I'm sure many of you here are economists, so we all know that there's never more supply than demand. It always balances. So something will change. Um, and my prediction is that demand will grow faster than we're expecting. Um, and we'll have a little bit delay in some of the supply that's coming on. And so the market will balance. Uh, what we saw from 2016 was that by the time we got to the winter months, where we had some weather-driven demand, uh, the market was actually pretty tight. And you can see that in the price behavior. Um, where we had prices at nine or ten dollars an MMBTU, not not only in Asia, um, but also in Southern Europe. So uh, we're working very hard as an industry to try to bring uh, new capacity to production. We we look around the world at the international projects to see what projects are really going to bring uh, new gas to market. And um, we believe that there will be kind of a call on additional capacity from the US to serve uh, roughly 70% of new demand. This demand from 2020 to 2025 is going to require another 100 million tons of liquefaction capacity to be built everywhere around the world. And if 70% of that needs to come from the US, that's about 70 million tons, which is basically doubling uh, what we have done in phase one. So for me, phase two is double for the US what phase one was. Um, so we need to uh, be very diligent as we are completing the engineering for these projects. Um, and, and we will uh, be working hard to, to bring uh, the new projects to market. Um, we all know that prices of LNG today um, in Europe and in Asia, especially during the summer, uh, I think today are between 450 and 550 in MMBTU. Um, so there are a lot of questions. How are uh, new projects going to be marketed? Um, are buyers able to meet their needs in the spot market? Do people need to sign long-term contracts? And uh, to all those questions, I don't have as many answers. Um, all I know is that uh, the winners in meeting the new market demand will be those that are the lowest cost. So this is what we are working on at Tellurian. 
Um, we know that we'll have one of the lowest cost uh, construction for liquefaction infrastructure. Uh, but we're also pursuing what other pieces in the value chain uh, need to get lower and lower cost. Um, if you could go back one, sorry. The upstream is very, very important. We have been able in the US to produce uh, gas at the wellhead for less than a dollar. So fundamentally, the US can uh, be one of the lowest cost producers, if not the lowest cost producer uh, in the world. And we have to look all along the chain. Gathering and processing needs to be low cost. Um, terminal shipping and transportation pipelines need to all be low cost. And we can see on a variable cost basis, we will always be able to deliver to Europe at $3.50, $3.60. And on a, um, on a more equilibrium price basis, uh, where we and Russia are able to supply into Europe on a long-term equilibrium, a $6 long-term price in Europe is very competitive and uh, allows the industry to return its cost of capital. Um, so as LNG gets more and more commoditized and people, uh, buyers, are meeting their needs for, for short-term and long-term gas, the key is going to be to be the lowest cost. Okay, now. <laughs> um, so I guess in summary, um, three things. The, US, the world really needs additional gas. Um, when we, we must not be short-sighted uh, as we understand the fundamentals today. We have to look beyond that uh, to phase two. And, and the world needs uh, additional gas for you know, providing economic growth, uh, political stability, and cleaner air for the cities that they live in. Um, and the U.S. is uh, cost competitive. In, in fact, uh, may be the lowest cost. Um, so the key will be investment in infrastructure, and that is where I think everybody here can be supportive, um, that there needs to be additional investment in pipeline and export infrastructure in the U.S. for us to be successful. I'll leave you with one last thing, a tiny advertisement. This is an artist rendition of the Driftwood LNG terminal that um, Ambassador Morningstar was so kind to talk about in his introduction. Um, this is on a thousand acre site in Louisiana on the Calcasieu Channel. And uh, we're permitting this facility. We plan to start construction on it in 2018, so the middle of next year. Um, and it will be able to export about four BCF a day of gas from the US. So with that, um, I'm very eager to open it up to the audience and uh, hear your questions and foster a bit of discussion. very much, uh, Meg, for such a terrific review of where the situation lies today and uh, where you think uh, Tellurian can be and LNG exporters can be uh, over, over time. Uh, I have probably 20 questions that I could ask you, but I won't. Uh, so I'll uh, uh, ask uh, uh, one or two and then open it up and hopefully get a lot from the uh, a lot from the uh, audience. Uh, Paris, what effect do you think that the Paris Accord has on gas uh, as a necessary element to reach climate goals? And do you think, do you think that the decision by President Trump to uh, notify an intention to withdraw from Paris will have any effect on Tellurian, uh, uh, Tellurian's LNG exports, or will it be the market that will make that determination and uh, there'll be no, uh, for lack of a better term, even retribution uh, to U.S. companies as a result of the uh, 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 Paris decision? I'm supposed to speak louder. Could you all hear me? Okay. 
So um, pa the Paris decision, uh, I mean, for us was a interesting um, summary, I think, of what uh, countries and economies and, and frankly buyers are making the choice to do anyway, which is um, improve air quality, reduce carbon, um, benefit global warming um, by increasing use of, of natural gas and renewables. Um, we are obviously a natural gas company. We're building a natural gas export business. And so we're happy to export natural gas um, in support uh, of that mission. And what about the, the decision to withdraw from Paris? Do you think that will have any effect in any way with respect to your business? So I, I guess our general bias is that the market will decide. Um, sometimes hard for companies like us to predict what uh, political decisions will be made in reaction to other political decisions. Um, but uh, in general, expect that the market will continue to ask for more gas. Right. So basically, the cow is out of the barn and gas is going to be needed uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, meet, meet the uh, needs to lower emissions over a, a period of time. Let me ask you one more question, and then I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, you talked a lot about Europe and Russia, and that you feel strongly that you will be able uh, to compete uh, to compete as the low-cost producer uh, with with Russian piped gas. What, what if Russia is willing to, as it has in the past, use gas as more of a political weapon, drive the price down uh, to the point that it does create cost competitive kinds of issues. Do you see that, uh, do you see that, even if they're operating at a loss, uh, do you see that happening? What would the effect be? Uh, do you think that the countries that you're dealing with and the companies in the countries that you're dealing with, in order to be guaranteed that there will be alternative sources of supply, if necessary, and only if necessary, would pay extra to have that second source of supply? So, uh, so far we haven't seen any indication from, the, from Gazprom that they're willing to operate at a loss. Um, they've shown some willingness to renegotiate some of the contracts um, so that they are selling gas at more of a market price. Um, we've also seen European gas pricing move more to a gas index um, for a pricing basis and less of an oil index, which is positive for um, gas market competition. And uh, in terms of countries seeking alternatives, I think what we w can say is the best recommendation is to um, build additional infrastructure so that those options are available. And I think the moves that we saw um, Poland and Lithuania take with support from the European Union uh, and additional initiatives that the European Union is doing to support the construction of LNG import terminals um, will give countries, particularly in Eastern Europe, as we get a southbound LNG corridor and, and hopefully eventually also a northbound LNG corridor, um, access to the LNG market when uh, they need those supplies to maybe balance uh, their negotiating power with their Russian supplier. And as you may know, one of the things that we've certainly been pushing at the Atlantic Council is the North-South Corridor, which in, for Central and Eastern Europe, which is now being called the Three Seas Initiative, Seas, S-E-A, not C, uh, which is the Baltic, Adriatic, and the Black Sea, and hopefully those connections will happen both from Poland and Lithuania south, and I see our friend Ambassador Paro from Croatia hopefully going north as well from the Kirk Terminal in uh, Croatia and possibly in other places. Uh, Okay, let me open it up. I have some other questions, but let's see, let's get some questions from the audience and I can jump in if it seems relevant uh, uh, later. So please uh, raise your hands and identify who you are. Now we'll start over here in the second row. 
Uh, I'm Hai Gugaraz with Argus Media. Uh, for your own project, you have an uh, innovative approach of uh, marking the get uh, fixed uh, a price supply. Uh, so the question for you is, uh, how would uh, your company hedge exposure uh, to commodity that is uh, abundant, but the price is unpredictable? So it's a good question, and, and for um, the rest of the group, we have um, offered buyers a fixed price a contract from 2023 to 2028. When we announced that offering, we were in Tokyo, so we were talking about delivered into Tokyo Bay at a fixed price of $8 per MMBTU. Um, and uh, the, I guess, risk management sort of of the commodity exposure was the question. Um, frankly, there would, there's not commodity exposure on you know, a cash basis um, since we would be willing to sell at a fixed price. Um, the key then is managing our risk on the cost side. Um, so for that, we will need to know what is our cost of gas. Um, and we'll know our cost of gas uh, really from a combination of th three ways. Um, we can either hedge that financially um, with a, another strategic or banking institution. Um, we can buy gas from producers uh, off the pipeline system or, or back into the field and uh, manage that price risk together with them. Or we can produce the gas ourselves. And if we are producing the gas from the field, we'll know our cost very well uh, with a little bit of sensitivity for, for fluctuations in service costs. Can so he asked if what, we what had... Do, he didn't have the microphone. What did ah, that's I'm true. sorry. Uh, and uh, is <laughs> any of the free options looking more uh, likely than the other? I think it's too early to say. We are um, pursuing all three of them, um, and you know, hopefully, we'll we'll know within the next year um, as we get closer to, to contracting. We'll have to solve the supply side as well. Okay, I, uh, Mr. Hershey. I'm, I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent will you be relying on economies of scale and improving technologies for getting your costs down and getting your product so it meets the competition? We will, we will be relying a lot on economies of scale. LNG construction is a massive economies of scale business. And there are some um, projects that talk about uh, small scale, and in fact, you know, we did some research on trying to reduce the size of the, the plant um, to bring smaller quantities into market as the market grows. What we learned is that there really are no economies of small. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we arrived on a design which is for a 26 million ton uh, plant. It will have three very large storage tanks that contain each about three and a half BCF of gas, of LNG. Um, and, and we'll have three berths, so capable of birthing three vessels at a time. That's a you know, very large plant. It will consume about four, four and a half BCF a day of gas. Um, and, and that economy of scale is very important to uh, reduce the cost. We know from our work with Bechtel, um, GE, and Chart Industries, who are really our technology uh, informal partners, and they'll be our EPC contractor, that we can build the facility for less than uh, $600 a ton, um, which is kind of the way we compare LNG construction costs. But the total facility will be uh, about $15 billion of construction. Thank you. Uh, I see a couple of hands here, for, uh, and towards the back, the gentleman towards the back. Thank you. 
uh, Chris can cover. <coughs> excuse me, Chris can cover the BRG. Hi, Meg. Hi, Chris. Um, my question concerns uh, competition and supply. A lot of uh, attention in these fora is dedicated toward competition with pipeline gas in Europe, principally Russia and, and Algeria. Um, but in the global LNG market, there's a lot of dynamism on supply right now. Um, there's been declining reserves and reduced or eliminated production in places like Egypt, Indonesia, Trinidad. There is competition for domestic gas in Australia, and now there's a political spat in the Middle East with Qatar. I wonder if you could address the supply side of um, the outlook for US LNG exports and how you see that going forward, how you see that affecting the opportunity. And if I could also just weave into that and pick up on your comment about no economies of small. Um, you have several competitors in the US going for integrated small scale technology stitched together into bigger plants. I'm talking about Magnolia, Venture Global, even Elba uh, using some of these uh, sort of smaller scale prefabricated uh, liquefaction trains and then building them into a bigger project. So if, you, if, if that's what you meant by there's no economy of small, if you could also talk about those economics on the competitive horizon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, I'm going to start with your last question first. So um, we don't actually know the economics of the other projects. Um, we certainly wish them all the best uh, in succeeding with, with their design. And to the extent that additional innovation for the industry, um, that I think is a win for, for all of us. Um, all we know really is what we learned when we were studying uh, the option to, to build smaller and smaller. And we were hopeful that we could build one million ton trains so that one million ton plants essentially so that we could uh, deliver smaller quantity to the market which would be easier to move into the market and less total dollars uh, to get started. Um, and we found that it, it just simply didn't work. It, it was not actually cheaper. Um, we also interestingly found that building uh, the equipment uh, overseas in some of the international yards and transporting it to the US in a modular fashion was also not cheaper. Um, and, and so actually that's going to be even better for uh, the benefits to US manufacturing um, because all the fabrication will, will happen at the site. Um, so I think, I mean, we can only share what we actually have from our own empirical um, evidence. Um, I think next you were asking about uh, supply internationally and competition uh, of supply. And uh, there are uh, many projects worldwide, um, but only about 30 million tons, I, I think, uh, at best, that can bring new gas outside of the US to market by 2025. And those are really um, a couple trains in Papua New Guinea. Um, and maybe some of the East African projects, if they're able to solve, you know, some geopolitical challenges to their timeline, and and solve uh, their economics. Um, they won't necessarily be cheaper than the U.S., uh, but they are a new supply area with substantial amount of reserves. Um, so as we look to 2025, the need for 100 million tons of new liquefaction capacity, it's really kind of staggering to think that uh, 70 million tons is, is sort of the call on gas from the US. And, and really, we have to say that we welcome everyone who can make that timeline, um, because we, we know that um, we'll be supplying 26 million tons. Uh, so many other projects need to come uh, to successful completion. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we, I know there are more hands out there. I'm going to jump in with a question because I want to make sure we get to it. Uh, and we do have some time, plenty of time left. Uh, we've talked a lot about Europe uh, and the ability uh, for companies, for you to compete 
uh, and for our LNG to compete in Europe. Uh, but there's also been a lot of talk re even more recently about Asia after the President's meeting, President Trump's meeting with President Xi and China being interested in U.S. Uh, LNG, uh, LNG exports. Uh, obviously, Japan and Korea are going to be looking for, uh, for more and more gas and maybe from, you know, alternatives from coming from the Middle East. How do you see that marketplace as an opportunity and how well can U.S. companies and Tellurian compete, how well can they compete from the Gulf Coast uh, in uh, sending, sending product to Asia or will there ultimately have to be, uh, in your view, West Coast facilities? Um, so as we look at the Asian market, Asia today consumes about three quarters of LNG um, production. And those are very, very important markets and some of them are growing a lot. So we talked a little bit about China. Um, the, the president's support of sending LNG to China um, we viewed as a positive step um, for U.S. exports uh, and expect the Chinese market to be significant and growing. Um, uh, we view China as, uh, I guess, having the ability to become almost a 100 million ton market from between 30 and 40 million tons today. Uh, it's uncertain how long it will take them to grow to be that large. Some of that will depend on how aggressive they are with uh, decommissioning coal and, and encouraging natural gas and what is the balance of natural gas uh, and renewables. Um, we've seen in Korea a little bit of a change in their coal policy. So they were um, supporting a lot of coal-fired plants and, and have now uh, changed back to gas. So some of the planning process in, in Korea is in progress and will be continuing through the balance of the year and then we'll be able to see a little bit better what they're expecting for increased gas imports and of course, uh, Japan, the largest single gas Im or LNG importing country, is a very, very important um, LNG ally. Um, I don't believe that we need projects on the West Coast in order to serve Asia. Uh, we can transport cargoes through the Panama Canal um, or around uh, the Horn, not through the Panama Canal, and still be delivering LNG on a competitive basis to Asia. And in fact, um, with production costs where they are today um, and what we know about the cost of new liquefaction construction, we can see that the U.S. is actually the lowest cost source of new projects, uh, even delivered all the way to Asia and factoring in the shipping cost. Oh, all of a sudden we have now about eight or ten hands. Uh -oh, That's great. I said something okay, controversial. I'll start, I'll start with Doug Hingle right here in the aisle. Here. Hi. Uh, Doug Hingle with LNG Allies. So the first group of projects were able to go to FID based on having long-term contracts that could get them financing. There seems to be a reluctance now among customers to sign those kinds of long-term contracts. So how do you arrange the financing for yours and other new projects? Um, so there is some uncertainty with how the LNG model needs to work going forward. Um, the uh, spot market or spot in LNG is near-term cargoes and really as, as long as I think four-year contracts. Um, is growing uh, significantly and with U.S. LNG coming to market, it will get a lot more flexible. Um, spot or short-term contracts today represent about 30% of the market. We expect that to be about 50% by 2020 and, you know, three-quarters of the market by 2025. Um, now, a lot of that is really gas that is getting retraded. Uh, and companies that signed long-term contracts that are then re-optimizing portfolios. Um, so for financing purposes, uh, we're really kind of 
returning all the banks back to the model that they had in the past, um, which is uh, produce the resource, send it through the liquefaction plant uh, into the, the global market at global commodity prices. Um, still uncertain how long-term or short-term those contracts will be. And so really we're preparing for a portfolio of customers, some of which are long-term, medium-term, and, and short-term. Um, and we're working with a, a financial community. We have a bank advisor um, on catering the, the financing to respond to that. What is, um, along those lines, <coughs> uh, looking particularly at short to midterm, uh, the role of international financial institutions? And is it going to be important to be working with, uh, you know, XM Bank, other uh, other uh, uh, financial institutions, you know, IFC, uh, EBRD, uh, and on and on. Uh, how important is that going to be over the coming months and years? So I think there's a very interesting role for some of the international bank intermediaries to um, provide credit support in developing countries that are developing power generation plants and actually uh, are happy to sign long-term contracts because they're financing a power plant and so knowing that they have 20-year gas for their power plant helps their own financing. Uh, some of those markets are, are smaller and maybe not investment grade credit and so as we're uh, as suppliers selling into those markets um, credit enhancement that can be provided by the international banks um, is, is actually uh, a very important role. Um, we worked with um, particularly the XM Bank in, in Korea when we financed some of the original uh, liquefaction infrastructure in the US. Um, but really they came in the same as the other uh, commercial banks and investment banks in, in the US. Um, so they were an important financial partner um, because Sabine Pass had a, a co-gas as an offtake um, customer. So that was an interesting structure that I think we'd welcome continuing in the future. Did you? Uh, I saw earlier on Ambassador Kozlerich's hand. Uh, Rich Kozlerich from George Mason University. Um, you talked about the West Coast. What about the East Coast? And where do you see the gas that's being produced in the Northeast going? Um, so I think that it's now well understood that the Marcellus and Utica is maybe the largest single gas field in the world. Um, there have been a lot of reversals of pipeline flows to be able to bring that gas into the Gulf Coast. Um, of course, the Cove Point LNG facility is uh, being uh, converted from an import terminal to an export terminal, and that's located um, in Maryland. And the Elba Island facility it will also be able to export uh, gas from Georgia. Um, there are also some sites uh, in eastern Canada that have liquefaction uh, projects. So all of those will be helpful to ha handling the gas. We candidly are going to need additional in investment in pipelines to be able to bring more Marcellus gas uh, into the Gulf Coast and it can be easily exported from the Gulf Coast. Um, if the communities on the East Coast were, were supportive of liquefaction terminals, those that may be another way to export gas from the East Coast. But we found as we were looking for um, land uh, and sites to put liquefaction terminals that the communities on the East Coast were not very enthusiastic to have that infrastructure there which is why you know, we finally began developing projects on the Gulf Coast um, where the communities were very welcoming for that infrastructure investment. So with just some additional pipelines, the, the gas from the east can be exported from the Gulf Coast and will still be economic delivered to market. There seem to be at least two issues. One, you've emphasized uh, <clears throat> the need for pi the need for pipeline <coughs> excuse me pipeline infrastructure 
Uh, also, the question of new, uh, uh, new liquefaction uh, facilities uh, come up. And I think, you know, they are, I think, you know, very different issues. Do you think with the new administration <coughs> that this process might, <coughs> on either side, either pipelines or infrastructure on the coast, uh, will become easier? Or is the problem more, as you just said, of the issues of a state and local nature that will make that difficult, whatever the federal regulatory structure, uh, federal regulatory structure is. And with respect to permitting of new facilities on the coast, uh, <coughs> former Secretary Moniz always used to say, well, it's the big issue. Every license has been granted. Is there a problem with respect to speed of licensing, and do you expect that to be, if so, do you expect that to be mitigated with this new administration? We have had a very positive experience um, <coughs> with our work with the FERC on permitting LNG facilities, both import terminals and export terminals. Um, one thing that's great about the regulatory process in the U.S., especially compared to international, is that uh, it is a process and it, and it is fairly transparent. Um, we believe that the new administration will be supportive of um, more efficiency in that process, um, and we hope that you know, we'll see some of the time that it takes to get through permitting um, become a little bit shorter and, and streamlined. Um, and I think that's generally what we look to from, from the federal uh, government and the federal agencies is to uh, permit the infrastructure provided that the developers are coming with, you know, a well-prepared and properly engineered and, and with a, a right amount of safety uh, standards employed uh, that that be able to go through the regulatory process efficiently. Um, we also understand that not every community uh, is welcoming to infrastructure, and we've always uh, been respectful of, of those communities and, and simply chosen sites or pipeline routes um, that go in more friendly areas. We've had uh, the fortunate experience of building infrastructure on the Gulf Coast um, and understand that it's harder to find routings uh, in other parts of the country. Um, and we know that, you know, we need to uh, help on educating communities the importance of some of the pipeline routings that are going to be needed to support uh, infrastructure for the East Coast gas. Uh, Bartosz from the Polish Embassy has a question. Uh, hi, I, I've got a question about, uh, uh, we talk a lot about the LNG, uh, US LNG gas uh, getting to, to Europe. Uh, one of the key problems that we have found now is that uh, the US LNG uh, gas is sold based on the Henry hub, uh, which, is, uh, which is a different hub that we are trading the gas back in Europe. And uh, so what we see, if, you know, if we talk about competitiveness and making the US LNG gas being competitive, in a medium and long term, for companies like Pegenige, you know, this is the monopoly biggest company back in, in, uh, in Poland, what is important really, because they are looking for the medium contracts, but the problem is the, the pricing. I mean, how we can, do you believe that there is a chance in future that the US LNG gas can be actually sold uh, based on a different than Henry Hub um, pricing mechanism? Thank you. So we believe that gas um, in Europe should be sold on a TTF basis, and we are preparing to be able to deliver LNG to Europe uh, indexed to TTF. Will that be helpful? Yeah. <laughs> Send a message back. <laughs> <laughs> I, there were a bunch of hands towards the middle, and then I see one over there. I see. Uh, let's start with Bob Icord. We need a you need a microphone. Wanted to follow up on uh, Ambassador Morningstar's question about the Asia gas market. Um, I think it was April uh, 
the leading companies in China, Japan, and South Korea did an MOU to try to develop a more flexible procurement approach. Uh, and of course, they represent 50% of the imports. So uh, two parts. One is, what can you tell me about what they are after in terms of flexibility in the contracting process? And two, do you see the development of a significant hub in Singapore or something like that in the future that's going to provide this kind of Asia price market? Um, so in terms of flexibility, they are um, first and foremost focused on destination flexibility, which really for them means that um, they can purchase LNG and they don't have to take it to one of three terminals, which is how historically LNG contracting happened, um, where the, the supplier had a lot of control in the contract and the buyer was only able to take it to a few places in their market. So um, they really took the, the model of the US, which all of the US uh, exporting terminals said, I'm going to sell it to the buyer. The buyer picks it up in the US Gulf Coast and can take it, or the East Coast in the case of Cove Point, and can take it to any destination that you wish. And so um, Korea and Japan said, OK, well, we want this to happen with all LNG sellers. Um, they are also looking for some additional flexibility in terms of uh, winter versus summer load, um, ability to cancel a few cargoes a year if they don't need it all. Uh, though some of those features were part of historical contracts that they're trying to continue. Um, and then you had a part two. Oh yeah, the hubs. Um, we would very, very much like to see Asian pricing which had hub qualities, including a futures market. Because there's no uh, gas index, really, in Asia. In the US, we have many, many hubs. The most famous one is the Henry Hub. Um, but a lot of hub pricing. And of course, the NYMEX financial contract is traded on a futures basis based on Henry Hub. And Europe has the national balancing point and a futures contract and the TTF contract and other hubs in Europe. So we're very, very supportive of that happening in Asia as well. Um, there is a futures contract in Singapore, not very much physical gas traded there yet, although they do import um, LNG. <coughs> Um, Japan has probably the most liquid physical market with maybe 80 cargoes a month that come into Tokyo Bay, but no futures contract. Um, the Chinese are trying to develop a hub that encompasses all of Asia. Um, so I think, yes, there will be Asian hubs, and there will be more than one. Uh, the woman in the middle over there. Thank you. It's Dora Zambri with the Embassy of Hungary. And uh, I really appreciate that you underlined the security aspect of uh, the European market. And uh, like I do appreciate that many uh, people in this room like have been working on uh, to enhance European security. And some joined your team as well. <laughs> and uh, so my question is related to the fact that like 2020, this is uh, like uh, the year that we are counting on many long-term contracts are due to expire around uh, this time in Europe as well. But there's also talk about like other dedicated pipelines from the dominant supplier. Uh, so my question is that how do you see um, the market, the European market uh, around 2020? Thank you. So um, the European market for 2020, I. I think that Russia has, for many, many decades, applied gas into Europe. Um, and that the uh, European buyers are not necessarily trying to kick Russia out of their supply portfolio. They're simply seeking 
um, balancing alternatives so that uh, buyers have choice. Um, and for choice to occur, the most important ingredient is infrastructure that provides access to mul multiple sources of supply. Um, so when we look at, and particularly the Eastern European nations, and we try to determine how can we be flexible enough um, to provide uh, corridors where LNG can, can bring supply um, to those countries in a way that, that gives consumers choice. I'll buy some LNG, I'll buy some Russian gas. Um, this is where we're, we're trying to find solutions, both for uh, LNG coming from the north, southbound, and, and from the south, um, northbound. And we really ask um, you as buyers uh, to work with us together on you know, managing the risk so that we can make some investments to, to be able to give you choice and you can make some investments in infrastructure uh, to have that, that corridor available. To follow up on that, how do, you, how do you look at political and commercial risk, a combination of them? For example, do you think about Nord Stream 2? I mean, do you worry about it? Do you have concerns about it, if you want to even say? Uh, the, the Qatar situation is that, do you look at that as just a momentary blip that may or may not have any consequence? How, how do you deal with those kinds of issues? I think on Nord Stream 2, um, well, it isn't obvious to, to me yet that Nord Stream 2 is needed. Primarily because Nord Stream 1, I don't it's think, is operating at full capacity. Right. Um, and, and so in that scenario, um, what is the support that, that brings Nord Stream 2 to market and how open access is that um, for buyers to, to be able to uh, have the right amount of, of choice in, in their supply. So do we worry about Nord Stream 2? I don't think uh, we worry about it so much. Um, keeping in mind, we're an economic body, <laughs> not so much a political body. Uh, and so we really look at Nord Stream 2 more as, okay, w when will the market actually economically support it? Um, in, in Qatar, uh, this has introduced you know, an, an additional element of uncertainty. Um, we haven't seen uh, supply actually being cut uh, from, from Qatar, and, and Qatar today produces about 77 million tons of LNG. So very, very important supplier to the, to the market. And, and uncertainty over supplies from one of the largest producers is, is never good for the market. Um, I think in, it may make Qatari supply a little bit more expensive. Um, and, but definitely it's something that that we watch and with a little bit of concern because at the end of the day, we want the LNG market to be stable. Okay. Um, Fred Hutchison. Fred Hutchison with LNG Allies. Um, Nick, uh, I'll pick up on something that you had in your presentation. So last year, uh, last week, Statoil put out their 2017 energy perspectives. And it looked at three different scenarios. And in all of those scenarios, both for oil and gas, it showed a real supply-demand imbalance opening up and, and potentially being at a very at a enormous level into the future. Um, BP's is out with their uh, this week. Um, could you maybe give us a, a little thought? Is, is the consensus among analysts and others in the business uh, that, in fact, we're heading past a point of no return fairly quickly on supply and demand? I think there is a consensus that more LNG is needed by 2022. Um, the big question mark is, will that happen earlier? Because if, um, if we need more supply by 2022, the industry can t still meet that. Uh, building more LNG infrastructure is about a four-year um, timeline. 
So as long as we're beginning construction in 2018, we can meet demand growth in 2022. Um, so the, the question is, what will we do on the supply side if um, that's actually tightening it earlier than that? And uh, what will we do if we're not, as an industry, able to begin enough construction in 2018 or 2019? Um, and a, as we look at, okay, long-term, um, I guess, prices that tell you to build new infrastructure, uh, that's really kind of $6 in Europe and, and $8 in Asia. And as we talked about earlier, we're at, you know, $5.50. So we all, as uh, buyers and sellers, have to kind of look forward to the imbalance in the market and say, we are proceeding um, with construction because we believe that that is needed um, and that the, the market will tighten. And we may have to do that a little bit earlier than the actual price signal. Um, we did see uh, before this round of construction, we had a very flat period in uh, LNG market growth. And it really came from no additions on the supply side. Um, and you can see it in you know, the LNG production uh, and then also in the price uh, where we had LNG prices way north of $10 an MMBTU. Just a very brief commercial. Fred, you mentioned BP. We will be hosting on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock Spencer Dale, the chief economist of BP, who will present their statistical outlook. So I hope all of you will be here Thursday morning at 9 o'clock. Randy, 9 o'clock, right? Any anyway, event, you all should have probably gotten notice of it. It's on our website. Uh, yes, you've been had your hand up for a long time. Thank you, Tom Tiernan with the Foster Report newsletter. At one point on the LNG cargoes uh, to Europe, you mentioned a bit of price separation between natural gas and oil. Um, I was wondering, for Tellurian, is that something you're banking on quite literally? Or is it more just something you see that might be a, a nice byproduct for the gas market globally? Um, so for the health of gas markets, we really believe that gas should be bought and sold on a gas index. Um, and, and that, you know, the fundamentals of the gas market aren't always the same as the fundamentals of the oil market. Um, so, you know, we're very supportive of that decoupling, if you would, um, between oil and gas. And in fact, gas prices in the U.S. are completely uh, inversely correlated with, with oil um, today. So, um, are we hopeful that that will happen? I think we are as economists who want markets to work efficiently. Um, do we need that to happen for additional infrastructure to be supported? No, not necessarily. Um, particularly if we know our cost of production, I mean, I suppose we could sell gas on a gas index, an oil index, a coal index, a power index, a peanut oil index. <laughs> But um, at the end of the day, it, it's uh, better for the efficient um, operation of the market if we are, you know, producing gas and selling it on a gas index. So, yes. Hi, my name is Katie Bays. I'm from a firm called Height Securities in DC, and I was curious. You know, you mentioned that in this past winter. Prices uh, in the spot market bumped up slightly in excess of kind of that threshold, $8 a million BTU in Asia, at which point the market is telling us to build more infrastructure. I'm curious on what kind of, well, first of all, do you feel like that period of time changed the conversation that you all were having with buyers? And then on what kind of a sustained basis do you think prices need to stay supported above $8, or do you think we'll see more volatility and we kind of need to get to some general consensus that uh, seasonally we need more gas and we don't need more gas in April kind of a thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I definitely think you're right that, that last winter was a very important price lesson for buyers and it did start to change the discussion um, because there, you know, it wasn't like uh, 
a lot of people were looking for cargoes and they couldn't be found, and so prices were spiking. Um, there was, you know, just sort of a gentle, gradual increase in, in the price in, in the winter um, as, you know, we had some cold weather in parts of the world. And, it, and the most telling was that it didn't occur only in Asia. Um, it happened also in Southern Europe, um, wh which really tells you that uh, Spain, Italy, uh, when they were needing cargoes for winter demand, they were having to pay the same price as Asia um, to attract those those cargoes to that market. So um, among uh, a lot of the buyers, they recognized, um, okay, we, we need to start talking about contracts. Um, we don't necessarily um, have the luxury to sit in the spot market. Uh, and especially for, for base load needs, um, we need to be strategic about the way we think about our, our contracting. Okay, we have, a, we have a little less than 10 minutes left. Let, let's take three or four questions at once, and then you can respond as you would like to, to those questions. We'll see if we have any time after that. So starting over here. Hi, Rachel Adams heard with S&P Global Market Intelligence. Um, going back to the short-term contracts, is the fixed price structure the only way Tlorian would incorporate a good portion of short-term contracts in its portfolio? Are you looking at other ways to have something more like a five-year deal? Um, and if so, what would those look like? Okay, so that's one question. I saw three hands towards the back. Yes. Hi, my name is Chris Tucker with FTI Consulting here in town. Just a question on the basins that are going to be feeding into this LNG expansion along the Gulf Coast, especially, I mentioned Marcellus before, obviously the Permian. I wonder if you have any thoughts on the Haynesville specifically. We've seen a rig count doubling there in the past year. Massive field, non-associated gas, closest to the infrastructure. Do you expect that to be a major sort of supplier of, of the, uh, especially on the Gulf Coast? Okay. Then two per, two people, uh, the, the gentleman just next to you all. Hi, Casey O'Shea, also with FTI Consulting. Just curious in this period of oversupply, uh, through 2022, 2025, if you anticipate uh, any sort of wave of consolidation or acquisition in the industry. Okay, one more right now. Okay, at the, on the aisle there. Uh, uh, I was looking at the person right <laughs> over here. Sorry. Well, Hi, maybe we'll take two more. These are short questions. Hi, um, Abdiel Santiago. I run the, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund out of Panama. So my question is on Panama. Uh, you, you mentioned something that, that, that struck me because, um, you know, the whole LNG trade and, and the shipping that goes through now, given the expansion, is it was not, uh, it was not planned, and, and it's been a godsend for, for the canal. But you did say that, that, you know, you can go through the Panama Canal or not. And so what is the driver for not going you know, to, to the Panama Canal? Okay, now we will take that la the question on the aisle, and that'll be the last question. Uh, TJ Conway, uh, Energy Intelligence uh, Research and Advisory. Um, just a question on the competitiveness of gas looking out into the 2020s. We are seeing that renewables costs are coming down pretty significantly, and um, and it, we're seeing increasingly, I think, that a policy mi uh, a mix of, of coal and renewables is, is also something that a lot of countries are considering. So uh, do you anticipate any downside demand risks related to, to the competitiveness of gas vis-a-vis -vis coal and renewables looking out in the 2020s? Can you remember all those? No, but I think you're going to help me, right? If I got, okay. but I'm not sure I got them down right, but so we'll see. So, <laughs> on the, the question about uh, five-year contracts, um, we, will, we would sell LNG on a five-year basis index to um, Henry Hub or European market price, uh, so not only fixed price. On um, the question about the Panama Canal, uh, we're very excited and congratulations for opening the Panama Canal. Um, and we've observed that the key to the Panama Canal is earlier planning um, than maybe the industry expected to make sure that uh, the cargo ships have access to, to the slots. And um, I think the only reason not to go through the canal would be if there were no slots available um, for a long period of time. And we, we haven't seen that happening yet. So, so far, no reason to 
uh, avert the canal. Um, the two in the back. Uh, there was one on a, uh, uh, what was the second question? That was the only one I Oh, yeah, uh, the basin supplying the LNG expansion. Right. Uh, we definitely believe gas will come really from all the basins. So uh, we'll buy gas, you know, off the pipe and it, it will come from everywhere. Um, Haynesville is definitely very, very uh, attractive and for us who will be building in Louisiana, it's actually very proximate. Um, so the Haynesville um, gas field is a very, very strong producer in Louisiana. Then there was the, the question on the potential for acquisitions and, uh, then, yes. and then the competitiveness question. The, consol the consolidation in the industry and acquisitions, um, actually on, on the infrastructure side, um, I don't see a lot of acquisitions, uh, but on the upstream side, it's a very interesting time because a lot of the independents, uh, oil and gas producers, exited um, the upstream business in favor of private equity investors. And uh, some of those um, private equity investors are looking to um, exit by, by way of IPO, and a lot of these things are getting announced. So. There's some activity and, and turnover happening on the upstream side. And then downside in demand from renewables um, is definitely a big question mark. Um, and you know we are supportive of all kinds of technologies that can bring uh, more efficient and, and cleaner energy to our communities. Um, we foresee that gas demand will still be very strong, even side by side with renewables. And gas is a very, very important uh, backup for when the sun isn't shining, the wind isn't blowing, or the sand has covered the solar panels. Um, so, you know, we still view that we have many decades of gas working side by side with renewables. Well, this is great. I think we have come just to, um, virtually exactly <coughs> to the end. Uh, and I can't, offhand, I can't think of anything that we haven't covered, at least to some extent, uh, during, the, uh, during this dialogue. I thought the questions from all of you were, were really excellent questions. You covered everything beautifully. And so let's all give Meg Gentle a hand for uh, her presentation. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Really.